Welcome to the second part of chapter 51. Uh, we're going to pick up here with the idea of do animals think? And for this we really have to define what thinking is. There's quite a few animals that can use tools. You'll see this guy rocking a walking stick. Uh, there's others like chimps that can use sticks to go in and get termites to pull them out of the mound. Uh, birds do behavior like this. You've got otters that use stones to break apart clamshells. Uh, you have hunting animals, especially in packs, that oftentimes will plan and strategize together to bring down prey set ambushes. So ultimately this is kind of a difficult question as to defining exactly what thought is. But there's quite a few animals at least that do something that would at least be reminiscent of thought. Uh, that can do some things that appear to be beyond just pure basic instinctual type activities. Beyond this we've got the idea of sociobiology. So this is going to be saying alright let's look at this idea of behavior that we've been studying and let's try to frame it more in that ultimate sense, that evolutionary sense. So looking at this, you'll see there's different types of behaviors. We've got agonistic, which will be aggressive. So this is used when you've got pecking orders being established, so dominance. Uh, this tied in with that can be things like getting territory, so you can get mates and you can get food. So this can be threat displays, this could be certain dances, this could be attacking somebody else. But it's trying to typically intimidate another individual so you can get access to something that otherwise you would not. And then cooperation is kind of the opposite of that, where with cooperation now we have these organisms working together to oftentimes accomplish something they couldn't do on their own. Uh, so good examples of this will be animals that will hunt together so they can take down larger prey that they would not be able to by themselves. So this right here is going to be some wild dogs going after a larger stag trying to bring it down. But you can see these guys are small. They're not going to do this on their own. They might be able to, and I don't know if they'll be successful, but they might be able to if they cooperate. And then we've got agonistic behavior here. We've got spiders, two male spiders fighting over stuff. And we've got the two male hippos fighting. And you can see all the ladies and territory behind them that they are fighting over because they want this territory, they want these ladies, and they want the cushy life that comes from a nice territory. Now, mating systems, as we're going about territories and mates here, there's several ways to do this. Promiscuous just means we're not going to have any pairs. You know, we're just going to kind of meet up and then we go our own ways. So this is going to be very casual, there's no real bonding going on here. With monogamous, we're going to have a one-to-one -one bond. So we have one male, one female, they're going to stay together at least for a while so that they can produce children and raise them. Now polygamous is where you're going to have one of one side, so maybe one male, but then you're going to have a bunch of females or one female and a bunch of males. And so there's two ways of calling this. Polygyny is going to be one male with many females, so this is obviously the preferred rate, at least for me. Uh, and then you've got the rarer one, because keep in mind one male can impregnate a lot of females. It's a lot harder for you know one female to get impregnated by a lot of males simultaneously. Uh, much more awkward at least. With polyandry though you'll see some things like birds that lay eggs can breed with a male, leave the eggs with a male, and then go find another male. So there are some animals that will have one female with many males. But most of those have adapted some weird change in their reproductive strategy so that the females can leave eggs with the male and they can do the job of raising it. So like seahorses or something like that where they're just like, there you go, now you take care of this and I can go mosey on down and find somebody else. Now social communication. When we're talking about communication, one of the first ways you can do it is chemically. And so this chemical signaling is going to be called pheromones. Now most people think pheromones instantly are going to indicate sexy time. And that's one thing that they can do. Pheromones are released by males uh, and they can be released by females, especially when they're in heat or ovulating or ready for loving. And there are other ways of doing it though. You'll see there are alarm pheromones. So this can trigger animals around the individual that's releasing this to either spread out to kind of like evade something or sometimes to clump together for protection. So in this case, I don't know that it's an alarm pheromone, but it's still doing the same idea of causing clumping or aggregation. So it's basically telling these ladybugs, all right, let's all get together. And so these guys are releasing pheromones and causing there to be like this ball of ladybugs or lady beetles if we're being technical. 
So there's a variety of reasons for pheromones, but the key thing here is these are not hormones. These are, in, these are causing some response in another individual. So it's not about the ladybug that produced the pheromone having a response. It's about inducing a response in other organisms to then want to mate or run away or get together or whatever the case may be. Now other communications will be a bit more obvious. You've got more tactile uh, communication that bees will use, the waggle dance. And so the waggle dance is where they will ultimately loop and then during parts of the loop they'll waggle back and forth. And so this is usually going to indicate where you need to go to get to a food source. And so they'll oftentimes align their waggle with where the flower is, and then the other parts of it vary in duration, and so that duration tells them roughly how far it is. So that way the bees know where to go and how far they have to go to get there. And so their waggle dance has like significance. Uh, it's actually pretty elaborate stuff. And so this one's more physical. And then you've got auditory, which will be like songs. So this could be a cricket, it could be a bird song. There's a variety of different organisms that will use mating calls. Even mammals uh, can use these mating calls to try to attract other individuals. You'll also see there can be auditory communication that's not just about sexy time, where you can growl at someone. You know, you, we can use our regular words to try to get things across, like poetry. Uh, but there are plenty of audio signals that will be used between various animals to get something across. And some of these appear to be more or less hardwired, and some of these have to be taught. All right. Fitness is just the idea of how good are you at getting your genes passed on into the next generation. And there's two basic ways that you can do this. That's this idea of inclusive fitness. So when we talk about inclusive fitness, I'm saying one way to get your genes through is to make offspring, produce offspring. You know, these kittens are ultimately going to have genetics from this mother. And so that is one way for her to get her genes on to the next generation. The other way is kin selection. And this has to do with this idea of coefficient of relatedness. What this means is how identical is my DNA to yours. So for instance, my parents each gave me half of my genetics. So I should be 50% identical to them. My siblings also got genetics from my parents. I should be about 50% identical to them unless you're identical twins. Then it's 100. And so based upon how related you are to other organisms, how close of kin you are, this can mean that I can pass on many of my genes, maybe not all, but many of them, if I help out my close relatives. So if I help out my brothers or sisters, uh, if I help out ultimately what might be nieces, nephews, they still have a pretty good chunk of my genetics. So by helping them, I'm still helping many of my own genes persist into future generations. So it's not always just about how many kids I have. It can also be about how many individuals that I'm related to that have genes in common with me, I help reproduce as well or help survive. Now this coefficient of relatedness, this idea of kin selection is important for altruism, which is essentially doing good, doing something that doesn't just directly benefit you. In some cases, it harms you. And so if I'm going to be altruistic, so we've talked about vampire bats, that's what this cute little guy right here is, they will oftentimes regurgitate blood to feed bats that have not fed themselves. Now in this case, they're not related. That's one reason to do this. You know, I'll save my uh, daughter, I'll save my son, I might save, you know, brothers and sisters, and me saving them is beneficial to me because even if I die, my genes can still live on for the individuals I saved. So if I die so that the rest of my related family, you know, maybe you got like a large extended family living together, if I save a bunch of them, that is actually more beneficial than them all dying and me trying to pass on my genes. Instead, I let 10 of them continue having children because I sacrificed myself. So my genes are still getting the, the best deal here. But reciprocal altruism is when you do it more like friends. But what they tend to find is, I'll give you blood. But then later on, if I don't get to feed, you are expected to then give me blood if you fed. And so there's this idea where you just kind of give and take. And so that way you both benefit from this. You know, you both still make out because you're both more likely to live in the long run. So altruism doesn't seem to be good for the sake of good. It's usually good for the sake of your genes or good for the sake of survival in the case of reciprocal altruism. Now, colonial animals are kind of interesting because they only have a queen and then whoever the queen chooses to mate with that reproduces. The rest of the individuals, the workers, the soldiers, etc., they don't actually reproduce. But because they all are children, typically, of that queen, they have a high coefficient of relatedness, 
with everybody else. And so that means that it's beneficial once again for them to be willing to work and soldier on so that the, the queen can continue to churn out a whole bunch of kids that are effectively their sisters. You know, they're effectively in some cases their brothers, although it's rare to have males in many of these species. And so termites, ants, bees, those all kind of factor in. Uh, one of the only mammals would be the naked mole rat, that sexy fella right there. Uh, they also will follow this pattern where only that queen and whomever she chooses to mate with will reproduce. But the other individuals don't get a bad deal, so to speak, because they're related. That's the key bit is this kin selection makes it okay because me helping out the queen and the queen's children is still helping out my own genes in large part because I'm still at least 50% related to them. Now, last thing, I just love this. So picture a hot dog that's been left in a microwave a little too long. Add some buck teeth at one end, you can see those glorious chompers right there, and you've got a fairly good idea of what a naked mole rat looks like. I'll leave you with that, guys. Enjoy.